All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to All Outdoors with Muck Simons. Welcome back, everybody, for uh, uh, the, basically our new season of doing these video chats. Uh, welcome back, Darren. Uh, it's been a few months since we've done these. We took the summer and pretty much the whole fall off. I think we did one show with uh, Bobby and Disabled Hunting. Other than that, we've, just, we've all been super busy uh, trying to stay healthy with COVID. Anyways, tonight, uh, our first show back, we're going to have uh, Tim Jenny from PK Lures here tonight. It's a time of year now where hunting's pretty much all wrapped up. Everybody's either done processing their deer or making their sausage, and everybody's thinking about uh, doing ice fishing and getting their kids and families out there ice fishing. Generally, uh, this time of the year, the bite is really good. You see lots of people on the ice. Welcome, Tim. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into some uh, talk about the thickness of the ice and when it's safe like that but why don't you tell us about yourself what do you got going on thanks Mark. yeah uh most uh most of the uh the, the knowledge that i gained uh being an ice angler and and being in the outdoors was uh from just trial and error uh, i've been fishing now for probably my dad started taking me out when i was about 15 so in the boat uh, probably the first time i was out on a boat i didn't want anything to do with it the next time he couldn't keep me out of the boat and from there he just kept going and going and going so i've been fishing for probably about 45 years now uh enjoying every every bit of it uh had the luxury of uh doing quite well uh catching fish and and uh now as a, a canadian rep for pk lures uh this is kind of my retirement uh gift i guess you could say i've i uh, i was with the law enforcement for 25 years and uh now i just uh enjoy getting out on the on the water and on the ice and uh, uh, catching some fish. Uh, I have caught uh, you know some large fish over the last few years and and whatnot. Uh, I have probably I think nine fish now uh, over 14 pounds walleye uh, and uh, one of them was kind of my highlight would have been the uh, Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame World Record Division 4 uh, that was back a few years back with PK Lures and uh, that record's been broken a few times, but uh, it's all live release. The fish was let go back into the water and is out there somebody, somewhere, hopefully, for somebody to catch. He'd probably be a pretty big one now, but uh, no, just out there and enjoying myself and having a lot of fun and uh, catching fish and seeing if I can maybe give some tips that the anglers out there maybe missed or, or doing something that, you know, uh, they say, hey, maybe that'll help me catch a fish or two or maybe a big one or a trophy of lifetime. And... Uh, that's what we're here for to educate people and help out where we can. Excellent. Well, we're sure happy to have you on the program. Uh, Tim, probably the most important question we're going to have in this whole program tonight though, is when is it safe to start fishing on the ice like that? I, I, this time of year, especially on social media, you always see vehicles going through the ice. Why are guys continually pushing the envelope when it comes to getting on the ice? Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing is, is the education piece of it. Uh, guys like to again push that envelope you know they it's it's really exciting to get out their first ice the, the fish are big the guys that go out and and do that they gotta know what they're doing and they do uh i myself personally uh like to have about five to six inches you know i've been out on four before four or five but it's got to be quality ice you have to know where you're going and uh don't take any chances make sure you have yourself a you know your, your ice pick for your hands if you do break through a spud bar to test as you walk out every step you should be banging that ice because i've seen guys bang 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 and we've probably all done it too and it, oh boy that went through pretty fast back off and you can see that it's you know ice will fluctuate from from four inches to two inches pretty quick and if you're on that thin ice and that lets go and there's a hairline crack you don't see it uh it can be game over so the key is to make sure the ice is safe uh, your tackle shops, your, the, the internet is great for that. A lot of guys will say, hey, you know, go find out for yourself. Exactly. Don't trust anybody saying, ah, it's safe. You can drive a truck across. Don't listen. Go out, do it yourself. Check yourself. Because the last thing you, know, you need to, you know, find out is, oh, it isn't safe. We've got an instance right now here on Last Mountain Lake where a piece of the ice is, is, uh, is snow covered and the other piece is glare ice. And the reason that is uh, about four or five days uh, before, you know, everything was really solid, that ice gave way and pushed a lot of the water on top and crushed the ice down. So it was now open water. 
But the snow cover stuff, of course, that starts about Island View and then works all the way down towards past Grandview Beach, if you're familiar with the lake at all, that just has the one scenario. And there's other lakes out there probably the same uh, that froze later. So you're gonna have a difference of, of maybe two or three inches. So you could be walking on four inches and then seven and vice versa. So be careful, especially if you're taking out a quarter of skidoo, always, you know, just pay attention, test the ice, pound with your spud bar. And I always use a rule of, of, of five to six inches before I like to go out. And if you do go out earlier, you better know where you're going and what you're doing. Never cross a heave, number one. It is the most dangerous spot on a lake to cross. Uh, make sure you know where you're crossing and it's safe and uh, just take your time. You won't have a vehicle on the ice until it's at least at 12, four, 12 to 18 and small cars and then 18 or, or more for the bigger trucks and stuff like that. You got to be safe. You got to pay attention. And uh, right now it's the odd quad is out there. Most guys are still walking. It's hard for an old guy like me, <laughs> but uh, you got to do it. Safety number one, you're taking your kids out teach them the same thing. Number one, safety. Do not go out when the ice is, is poor quality. And uh, you should be having some good time. Um, I, I guess the other thing. Yeah, go ahead, but, Tim. Sorry. No, uh, the other thing is, again, preparation. Have your have your uh, your stuff like you can purchase your your ice picks and, and your spud bar and, and a small axe to move out and uh, baby steps, just go slow, you'll be fine. So I know we're gonna get into a little bit about technology and how it's changed dramatically in the last number of years for fishing. While we're on the, the ice subject, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, traditional clothing compared to the clothing that is available on the market now. I, I recall as a young guy, uh, my dad had the duck, the duck uh, full one piece parka or a denim jean parka and it would break the wind awesome but uh if my dad ever hadn't happened to go in that's not going to keep him buoyant what what are some things on the market that you suggest to some of our our listeners that are maybe you know veteran mm -hmm. people or some guys are just starting out what are some yeah. recommendations now with, yeah. with clothing? yeah well r right now there's a, a lot of these flotation uh, life jackets are just small little i mean they fit over you like a little little necklace basically and they they have a, a built-in uh, canister that will trigger off if you should fall in the water. I've seen guys using that already this year. There's flotation actual jackets made by a lot of different companies uh, that will actually keep you above water if you do break, break through the ice. Most of the stuff that you buy now that is, 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 is used for winter ice fishing and is designated for that, that's what you should concentrate on purchasing because there's not a, it's, I mean, it's terrible if you're out there and, and uh, you're cold and, or, or you do fall in the, in the water, you gotta have something that's gonna, you know, save you basically or give you some time to get out uh, pretty much all all the suits and that have some sort of flotation in them now but make sure that you go when you go to a tackle shop you ask about that uh, and uh, you should be fine it, it's come a long ways from the the old days where like you said the the green garbage jacket we call them too and and you fall in and you're done it's it's going to just suck you right into the water and and but preparation you have a rope go as a buddy uh, make sure you're doing the right things and uh, you should have no problem number one no fish is worth dying for. Be cautious you know, and you should be fine. It's a great sport if you do it right, you know, and you got to put everything in into that whole piece of the puzzle. It's all got to be, you know, your equipment's got to be top notch. You got to be prepared when you're going out there. You got to know where you're going. The tackle shops in, in, in most cities are really good. They'll, they'll tell you where to stay away from, you know, internet is good. Guys will say, hey, be careful. There's a break forming here. Don't go near there. You still get guys falling in. But, uh, you know, thank goodness, uh, it's mostly they're just in and then out type of thing or, or the break through a tire close to shore or whatever. But if you do break, break through, I mean, that's a different, that's a different animal. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what, if, what if your vehicle happens to break through? If it's the nose, um, you know, depending on the situation, some vehicles might stay, you know, above the water. Some might be starting to sink. What if you're in a vehicle? What are some, some tips that you can give uh, some of our listeners to what you have to do or what you must do uh, to get out of your vehicle? Well, I actually was, you know, I, I don't know if I was called lucky or unlucky, but I actually watched a vehicle coming down the lake. Uh, we were quite young at the time. I was probably 15, 16, and we were, we were ice fishing, and the truck started coming down the lake, or pardon me, the car started coming down the lake, and my dad goes, 
boy, that's not good ice over there where he's coming along. And uh, as he pr approached, we seen the splash. We seen these two guys get out of the vehicle, like the doors threw open and they literally rolled out, which is what I would suggest you do. They got out of, out of the vehicle, luckily, and rolled to the side. They were covered in water. I mean, they, you know, they were very lucky men. And I watched that vehicle with the windshield wipers going uh, back and forth. Sling, I mean, it took probably 30 seconds to slowly go down, but the key is quickness. I mean, those guys, I mean, I guess you could imagine uh, how you know, afraid you would be because those doors flew open pretty fast. They knew that they were in trouble. They rolled to the side and they knew that where they were going into was the deeper water. So they kind of came towards the back of the vehicle and then they circled back around. We had to actually call the RCP and, and keep them warm in our truck while they, you know, the RCP came and, and looked after things. But it was something they, you know, they, they weren't paying attention in my humble opinion. They went out, it was unsafe ice. Uh, they should have never been on it and uh, it almost cost them. But uh, that's the key, get away from the vehicle as fast as you can. Back, you know, you know, if you're driving and your nose goes down, then you know darn well that behind you is probably safer ice. So try and get back there if you can. But it's going to be quick. Uh, you, you might have a minute if you're lucky. Uh, on, those, uh, fast. on those big bodies of water, um, you know, particularly where I grew up, the Lake of the Prairies, uh, lots of uh, current, uh, lots of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. water running in from different streams and creeks and stuff like that. I, I do recall as a young guy going out with my dad with, uh, you know, with our snow machine and we had a shack and we were on the south side of the bridge and there was tons of ice and we drilled holes and we were just kind of bobbing around and we actually went and he parked underneath the bridge and we, he walked out on the north side, which is probably 25 feet from the, where we, you know, from the sled. And he started to punch one hole, moved over about five feet, went to uh, put a second hole in. And basically the, the auger just launched out of his hands and he just took him, like he just went right down. The, the, the ice was green, it was rotten. And this is in the middle of the winter time. So just that current, the north side of that bridge is not usually, uh, is very good because of that current, the ice doesn't last very long there. So you know, over the years, there's been lots of vehicles going down. So uh, bigger bodies of water, lots of current happening. So yeah, for sure, your ice conditions can change, like you said, overnight, really, sometimes. Oh, yeah. Like, be careful. I mean, your points, your your neck down areas, uh, heaves are really bad. Like, a, a, that, that's just like, you stay away from a heave. Don't even go near it. If you're going to stop far back, uh, you know, and we do that all the time. We'll, we'll, we'll be like 50 yards if we have to we'll walk up and take a look. No, it's a heave. Sometimes it's snow and you get fooled, but we don't go over heaves. We'll we'll go around. We actually, there's so many different access points on the lakes that if you have to, and we have, we'll go around to the other side and then come across if we have to. Never cross a heave if you can if you can avoid it. It's just like taboo. That is the worst. That's where I would say probably I I I'd venture to say 90% of the vehicles that go by, go into the water go because of a heave or a structure point. Uh, there's some real sharp points on Last Mile Lakes. One of them is Pelican Point. That that point can be open all the time. I mean, it's taken a lot of a lot of vehicles down. And uh, I think there was like seven or eight a few years ago that went into the water at Last Mile Lake through heaves or different points. And and just be careful. Even if it's three, four, you know, three, two to three feet of ice. I mean, it's amazing how all of a sudden it just be wide open. Right. Doesn't make sense a lot of times, but that water is always moving. So careful. So so we're going to get into technology and equipment because I guarantee that people are watching this program want to get into what, what, what techniques work for you, Tim. And cause I mean, they want to catch the best fish, but you know, one of the things, that, especially if you don't know the lake, like somebody like me, that's, I'm not that big of a fisherman. I love fishing, but I just don't have the gear for it. If I was to take my kids fishing, one of the, probably the biggest things that I don't understand is where do you, where do you fish? Like, how do you know where the walleye are going to be? I mean, you probably know from experience and maybe knowing the lake, but but how do you like how do you pick a spot to fish? Right, that, that, that's uh, you know that's a very good question because guys are asking me the same thing. Where are they where are they biting? I I was out you know about a week ago had a really good bite going and I haven't been back since. And guys say, well, why wouldn't you go right back to that same spot? A couple of reasons because just knowledge of, of where those fish might be migrating to or moving to or or safer ice that a guy can get to where there's not as many people uh, is is always a, a plus but if you're just starting out the first thing you have to do is is just uh, read look it up on the internet go to a tackle shop talk to other anglers uh, I mean these guys are wealth of knowledge they'll they'll tell you well here's a good area this is where your access point is to get on again 
caution is number one. We've taken out your family and friends and stuff like that, especially if you're green and there's a lot of guys that are just getting into the sport and uh, you'll see them racing down, a, you know, down the lake at, at uh, you know, 50 miles an hour. You don't want to do that. Uh, you want to take it easy. You want to be prepared if you have to stop. Uh, but to learn how to get to those spots is uh, aerial maps are really good. Local lake maps are really good. The internet's full of maps that you can use and information out there that, that you know, you'll be able to say, okay, I want to go to this spot or that spot and actually choose when the whole lake actually has fish on it. It's just through again, time and, and, uh, and just being out as much as a person gets to go out time after time, you learn every time I went to this spot, a couple of fish were caught. I went to that spot, a few fish were caught. Oh, here's a better spot. So it's just, it's trial and error a lot of times, uh, but there are key spots on the lake. There always is. Uh, there's community holes where guys catch a lot of fish and stuff like that, but to get out and, you know, kind of find those key spots too. Uh, there's a lot of mapping done now, shows you structure. Most guys will relate, you know, fishing to structure. I like to look for a, a flat with a drop-off. Uh, sometimes that drop-off, I want it, right now I want my drop-off to be fairly quickly, you know, drop down fast. Uh, you can do big flats uh, for, for different species of whole fish, but I like to have a, a drop-off, say, from, from that 18 then down to 23, 24, and down to 30, and then back out into the deeper water. But I always concentrate my, my efforts on under 30 feet of water. Uh, the record fish I talked about a few uh, minutes ago was caught in, in 21 feet of water. I don't like going deeper. Barotrauma starts where the fish, you know, their eyes start to bug out and their air sacs and, and you know, the buoyancy isn't good for them to be released again. So you want to try and stay, you know, under that 30 feet at all times. Those fish, will, you know, it's funny because those fish will come up and feed and they'll go back down into that deeper water. So if you're sitting in that, you know, my, my prime time or my, my best depth, if I want to say, is probably right now 18 to 24 feet of water. And I'll just run that ridge and that ridge will go right, right along that shoreline for, for miles at times. And I just keep bumping along and moving along, whether I'm walking or with a quad, or even when it gets safe enough with a truck, just keep moving down the structure because that school can be 50 yards away and you won't even know he's, they're there unless you actually just keep fishing and moving down. So, so do you keep drill, that in mind. Do you drill test holes for depth? Is that is that what you're kind of getting at? Yeah. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Some of the electronics that we have now actually has right on the right on the screen as you drive with your vehicle, you can see how deep you are approximate within a few feet, how deep you are as you're driving oh, wow. on your quad or your scoo or your truck. Yeah, and they're that advanced. So that that really helps. But again, knowledge and whatnot, you see a crowd of people, uh, you know, you don't want to try and impose, you know, you can get close to them because a lot of guys don't mind you coming and chatting, especially families and new, newcomers. I'm always talking to guys and, and helping them out as much as I can on the ice. I mean, it's a sport. We want everybody to enjoy it. So, uh, absolutely. Uh, so just, uh, just be friendly. I mean, you walk up to the guy, I've lent my ice auger out. Sometimes I'll dr drill it myself in the hole because they don't have an auger. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun when you're, you're helping other guys out too. That's, that's so. good community for sure. I, uh, yeah. I usually go with muck at this is a little point in my end for looking for a spot. If you find a lot of sunflower seeds where a guy's been sitting for a long time, that's a good spot to be. <laughs> that's a good spot, yeah. That's a good spot. Yeah, you know, you, hey, there's a blood spot over there. What yeah, happened? Well, Almost been a fish caught. Well, yeah, yeah. You, you will see areas where it looks like Swiss cheese, and you can say to yourself, well, it's it's like that for a reason. And the numbers of people there, too, will, will draw people, you know. Yeah. But convenience, too. There, there's some of the areas here that, you know, are, are right, basically little towns right on the on the – on the lake so uh, one for instance would be like regina beach well everybody from town goes they enjoy it it's a social event and those areas always produce fish so if you're starting out pick an area where you know uh, where you can actually uh, see a, a congregation of people and if there's an issue you can somebody can help you out but uh, again safety and just common courtesy goes a long ways and uh, you should have a lot of fun keep the kids warm you know get the right equipment it, it's all it's a big hole yeah. mess of stuff to get a, a fun adventure um, out there with the family and kids in regards to the lures and i know it, depending on what species we're talking about let's just talk about winter summer um mm -hmm. is there specific colors in the winter that are different than summer that attract fish uh different styles obviously you're going to be jigging you won't be trolling or or anything like that but is is there anything color wise that we should be looking for as, as first-time anglers or anglers that you would consider that would be something that or a flash uh, or movement yeah yeah, that's one of the questions that get posed to me a lot is like uh, type of day, you know, what time of day, like early morning, 
like I'm talking like a lot of times I'm sitting there on the ice and it's the crack of dawn. Like you're hunting, you're waiting for that deer to come along. Same mm -hmm. thing for walleye. If you, if you know your structure and they're coming up on 20 feet of water and, and they're sliding back down at the deep water or they're up feeding on the shallows and the flats. Uh, I like to go with a glow lure. And the reason I like glow is because I can charge it up uh, with a, uh, there's different versions. Like my Vexlar here has a, a glow ring on it and you set your lure right inside of it. I'll okay. show you. Actually, maybe the guys can see it. It's kind of cool because it's got a, this oh, nice. little ring here is called a glow ring and it'll charge up your lure. And what that does, and, That's cool. and it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. All you, all you do is you drop your, your lure right into the, into the opening and hold it there for a few seconds and it charges it right up. You know, I don't know if you can see it's, it's a lot brighter now. It's yeah. not dark, but this thing would, if it was nighttime or early morning, it's like having a little flashlight out there and the fish is coming along and he sees it. I mean, a lot of people just a regular lure without glow on it isn't as easily seen, obviously. And they'll just turn and boom. And I, I've been beside guys charging my, my lures up like crazy, out fishing them five to one because that fish is coming. Oh, what's that? He comes over, boom, he grabs it. That's a so great that's tip. kind of the key. I like low light. Yeah. Low light, low light conditions that last uh, uh, half hour at, at, you know, night and the first little uh, bit of, in the morning, always crucial. Or if you get discolored water, dirty stained water, doesn't hurt to charge up those lures. And uh, you'll probably see a, a, a big increase in the number of fish you catch with glow lures. Now, if it's sunny out, uh, I like myself personally, uh, gold, silvers, brass, anything really shiny to reflect off of that lure so that when it's flashing, uh, fish, oh, there's a minnow over there. So he goes to take a look and then he bites your bait. So that's that's crucial too. One thing that we talked about uh, flashes is PK Lures has what uh, uh, we call a Wyoming blade and it actually has a, I don't know if you can see it on there, but it's a little, yep. little curved blade. And that thing just flashes. Like if you were in the summertime when you're out in the, in the boat, you'll see minnows swimming and all of a sudden you see one flash in it. And that's what the, those fish are going to key on. They, they see that little flash and they zoom in to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. That's really kind of cool. I mean, you can put that Y wing blade on any, any lure. PK, most of them come with the Y wing blade and uh, it attracts the fish. It's vibration, sound, and visual. I mean, these lures here, are, I mean, they look like uh, crawdads and they look like perch. And I mean, you're trying to, you're trying to fool that fish into believing that, hey, that's, you know, that's something out there that I want to eat. You Tim, know? what's the name of that other one, that glow one? Like, what's the name of that? Somebody, if somebody's watching right now and says they have to have that, what's the name of that? The, the, this is the, uh, it's a Vexlar Glow, glow Ring, G-L-O Ring, R-I-N-G. Okay. It's made by Vexlar. There's other ones out there uh, that actually is like a little flashlight. You close the, close the container and it gives a little charge, it snaps it, and, and the infrared light just boop, and it charges it up big time. Do you run, like do, you run when you, do you run bait? with that as well? Like, do you, are you have anything on the trebles yep. there? Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll take a, a lot of guys, you know, frozen minnows, whether they're salted or not salted. And uh, I can show you a trick that I use a lot. And uh, I think it helps because a lot of guys will take, and, and one of the things that they do uh, at times is they overbait their hook. What I mean by that is they'll put, a, you know, a big minnow on there. Well, then you might as well just have a jig down there too. But the key to, to success, in my opinion, is, is, adjusting uh, your lure in such a way that your hook, I should say, I do a circle, I go right around it. So that when that fish now comes in to bite that hook. Oh, you have bait there, that's awesome. Use it. Yeah, so when he grabs it, if, if you've got the same hook with it hanging down like that, he coming in, he's grabbing that and he's pulling it off, it's gone. Yeah. With it wrapped around, he has a better chance to uh, to swallow the hook. That was Another a, that's the that best like. tip right there. Because I do exactly <laughs> what you just described. The, yeah. the, not that Another one, the other like one. Do. Yeah. <laughs> Another Another thing you can do is just the, the tip of the, uh, the minnow, the tail part. I just uh, punch it through the tail piece and it's a little bit tougher. And that just hang in there, just a little bit of a morsel. Never overbait your hooks. I don't care if you're using a PK lure or any other uh, lure out there. If you put too much bait on it, that fish just comes along, he steals, it's gone. And you can use just little pieces. You can use a fish eye, uh, anything like that. Uh, here's another little uh, trick I like to, if you're, if you're, one thing too, barbless is, uh, isn't in Saskatchewan, some of the provinces have it barbless. Uh, this one has a bar, but 
I like going through the top of the head because for whatever reason, it will just stay on there that much better, even when it's uh, barbless. So I go through the top, not, not through the throat part. Yeah. yeah, and that can help. And if you're barbless too, this, this wrap around, like I talked about, it gives some tension on the minnow itself, like so. So that if you are don't have barbs on it, the tension in the just the pulling out of the minnow itself uh, will actually you know allow the minnow to stay on there and be jiggled. That's a good tip. Um, yep. Those are those are jigging jigging spoons, correct, Tim? Yep, yep, okay. yep. Hey, They're jigging so spoons. Yeah, and PK has a whole you know uh, wrath of them. The colors are unbelievable. Uh, there's a lot of other spoons out there, jigging spoons too, that work well. Uh, but these ones seem to work very well for, for myself. And we've got them in every size too. I mean, it, here's a little, this, this thing is for crappie and perch and it's, I mean, that is tiny. That's a, less than a 16th of an ounce, like just super tiny. Yeah. Works too, it's, the it, little flasher blade. Yeah. It's unbelievable the strength, the strength of those hooks, like, you know, even those yeah. little hooks are just yeah. unreal. Yep. Yeah, we've caught, we've been fishing perch and, and, and hooked into seven, eight pound walleye and brought them in on those lures. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the, one of the new things for jigging is tungsten jigs. So how, mm -hmm. why tungsten jig? Why compared to a regular lead headed jig? What, what makes a tungsten jig that much more effective or, than a regular jig? Yeah, the density of the tungsten is, is heavier. So you can downsize and have this, you know, uh, a jig that's half the size basically and uh, that's that's the advantage that's why guys are going to that with the walking sinkers uh, and bullet sinkers guys use that for lindy rigging in the summertime but mm -hmm. your, your other jigs and stuff like that that are out there they're just smaller but the same weight and uh, okay. that seems to be key gets your bait down quicker with well, the water density is it dropping down it's it goes it drops fast so that that's one of the reasons guys go to tungsten plus in, environment right i mean that's that's uh, crucial we're all looking at trying you know do our best part that we can one thing about the pk lures is they're all environmentally friendly uh, they're made with a zinc alloy so there's no lead in them at all that uh, would, would contaminate the, the lakes if it should break off or you lose it in the rocks so that that's uh, crucial as well so that that helps i got another question this is, might be an old wives tale but Tying a lure on compared to a snap. A lot of people say you can't put a snap on, you shouldn't because the the reflection, the fish fish see that, they don't like this flash of it. We just talked about flashes. What about what about tying tying on compared to snaps? Obviously, when you work with different species, you're gonna need fluorocarbon or something that's a uh, jackfish can't bite off. What's what's your opinion yeah. about tying on compared to snaps yeah. and smalls and stuff? Yeah, when we're talking about get, you know chasing big walleye, uh I think the stealth is the is the answer here. These fish got big for a reason. They're not, you know, they're smart. They've seen hooks. And uh, what I like to do is I'll I'll take a I'll use it, use just a barrel swivel or just a simple snap swivel, just a tiny snap swivel. I don't know if you can see it there or not. Yeah. And uh, it looks big, but it actually isn't. And that that allows me to take that on and off really quick if I want to yeah. change colors. You know, I might I might be trying a, a red dog glow nickel back and then decide to put on a on a, uh, a fire tire glow and it's cold it's you're out there you know fishing and your hands are numb almost so these little snap swivels really you know they work well some people tie it direct sometimes you will get line twist if you're rigging it and jip it ripping it really hard so keep yeah. that in mind if you're ripping uh you might get some line twist uh you could use a barrel swivel on there too right on right onto the o-ring uh if you want right on top uh, but it's, it's preference too. Some people tie direct. Uh, uh, I like to put a, a little snap on there so I can quickly, again, in the winter time, your hands are cold on and off, on and off really fast, changing colors or, or, uh, baits. It, it seems to help. So, uh, I like to go with uh, a fluorocarbon leader on monofilament or a fluorocarbon leader on a super braid like fire line. Uh, when it gets really cold, the fire line, I, especially when I'm outside a lot, if you're in the shack, it's not so bad uh, because you got some heat. Uh, it freezes up really fast, so the monofilament and uh, the fluorocarbon doesn't, so you can peel the, you know, the ice off quickly. So I would say if you're asking six pound uh, fluorocarbon with, with mono is good, or straight fluorocarbon six pound uh, is good. And there's different types. Go to your tackle shops, and they'll explain which. There's some that are actually built directly and or specifically for ice fishing it's an ice line yeah. uh, I personally don't use that I use just a fluorocarbon uh, it's got less stretch 
you know, when you set that hook, when, when you're getting these fish up, uh, you know, up to that eight, 10, 12 pound mark, you got to rip that hook. And I mean, you got to, it's got to get a lot of pressure and you don't just want to sit there and gingerly, Oh, I got one and start reeling. You got to snap that jig as hard, you know, like jig fishing in the summer ooh, and rip it. I mean, there's a lot of bone and cartilage in there and you got to get in there. So keep that in mind. And six pound test seems to, to do the trick. Yeah. I don't put on a great big leader. You know, old guys say, well, there's big pike in here. I'll lose it on a, uh, on a pipe. But then that, that again, a big wall, he's not dumb, you know, or she's not dumb. She's been around for a while. So, uh, you know, stealth is, is always the key in my opinion. Six pound is, is probably what you're going to be looking for. Well, I want to talk about um, electronics and how they've changed ice fishing uh, cameras, you know, downhole cameras and, and you know, uh, sonars or depth, or, uh, depth uh, uh, stuff like that. But before we get into that, if mm -hmm. uh, what ice fishing technique would you recommend a novice use? The technique to catch a fish. Yeah, uh, I I would say uh, I, I would say that uh, you know any any lure that you have you'd want to bait it with something whether it's fish eye or a minnow, a minnow head. Again, don't over bait it. Uh, make contact with the bottom. Get your depth down. Reel it up about two or three inches and jig it up. You know, short snaps, five six inches, and then just jiggle it. Hit the bottom again. Lift it up. You know, five or six inches and jiggle it and hit the bottom. Kind of get a cadence set up. And you don't want to you don't want to do a yo-yo where it's just, it, 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 just up and down like this. The fish will get dizzy, and so will you. You want to get that pause because the pause is a trigger. You'll see it coming in, and you'll see the fish on your finder. Uh, and that's one thing I, I would suggest it is even as even the real low end models. I don't care if you're spending uh, you know big money on a on a hummingbird, a vexlar, a, a Lawrence. Get something that's going to tell you there's a fish there. And that's crucial because that'll allow you to continue to fish there. I mean, a lot of times back in the day, there was no, no electronics. We'd sit there all day and was there any fish down there? There might be, and there probably was. And these new units and stuff like that allow you to see how the fish is going to react to your spoon or your bait that you got there with a jigging, jigging wrap. Uh, you know, I don't care what kind of hook you're losing, using. That, that machine tells you, oh, look at, as soon as I jiggled it, he took off. I think so. I think that's one of the biggest advancements I've noticed in in especially uh, uh, ice shack fishing. You see these elaborate ice shacks with big screen TVs in there now, and they all have downhole yeah. electronics. They can actually see what yeah. that fish is doing, and it's pretty incredible the the success that they're having with that. Oh, it's amazing! There, you know, Panoptics is out there now where you see fish coming right up and and devouring, and you can tell the size and the type of fish now. Uh, it's it's amazing. Yeah, the electronics has come so far. Now you got the mapping. You can get a chip now and and, and pretty much never been on a lake before and say, okay, here's some structure. You see a you see a shoreline on your map, and all of a sudden there's a little elbow that comes out or a little you know a little dip into into the into the uh, shoreline. You set up on that little dip, and you'd be surprised how many fish use that as a track. And they run up and down that, and they drop down into the hole or up on top of some rocks, and that's crucial. Uh, it's, it's key to be on the spot on the spot too. I mean, I've got so many spots on, on the lakes that I fish that, I mean, you can be off 20 yards and you're, it's the dead sea, man. There'll be a lot of fish, you know, you might catch the odd one, but that key spot might only be 50 yard circle. Uh, you want to be there because they'll just sit in there or they'll come up from the deep or from the shallow where they were before, feed on that little structure and then drop down and, and you want to be intercepting them. That's the key. Electronics have kind of a million miles. That's uh, that's the reason we're catching so many fish. And again, I you know I'm an advocate of of catch and release. Uh, you know we like to keep our fish. We're going to have a good meal uh, between 18 and 20 inches. That's that's crucial. Let all the bigger ones go. The females and males that are larger than that, let them go. I mean, there you don't need to keep an eight or ten pound you know fish. It quick picture back it goes. And uh, if you keep under you know like that 30 foot and under. Uh, you're not going to kill those fish if you handle them properly, you know, have the right equipment to take the, the lures out. Uh, look after this fishery because that's, that's crucial. So a lot of people, have can be home, that. you know, the other, what's that? I said a lot of, a lot of people. I mean, the other day, like I, I would. Sorry, Tim. I was just saying a lot of people have no, a hard time understanding. A lot of people have a hard time understanding why we need to release those big fish. And uh, it's, it's, I'm an advocate as yeah. that as well. It's, you don't need to keep those, those are our spawning fish, mm -hmm. right? So. Right, exactly. You know, and, and the other day, I mean, I, I was out uh, a couple of days in a row here and I was out yesterday. I never took a fish home. 
uh, you know, I, I've got a couple left in the fridge. We're going to have them. They get freezer burn. You don't want to, you know, you, you get a good meal out of them. You're going again. Uh, you don't need to take them all like that. Uh, I didn't take any fish home, you know, so you kind of limit your catch and, you know, and that sort of thing and release those big dogs because uh, that's how they get bigger. That's how more people catch them. And, and we're all going to, you know, benefit from it because those are your prime spawners and that's, uh, that's crucial. What is a, what is a pro a like one. you, uh, Tim recommend for electronics? If, if somebody was like, I'd, I'd like to know what, what would get me good started. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, uh, I've been uh, Vexlar for a lot, a lot of years. I bounced back and forth for a different, a few different reasons, but, <clears throat> uh, probably the one reason I went back to Vexlar quite a few years back was just, uh, they're flawless. They're, they're simple to operate. Uh, they work really well. Um, in my opinion, and you don't have to get the best model out there. You can get the, the lesser models, but the key is to have some sort of flasher or, or electronics out there, whether it's a Vexler or Hummingbird or whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, uh, but have something because it's, it's going to show you the depth. So if you're sitting in 45 feet of water, you don't want to be there. You don't even want to try and fish it. So uh, find, find something that is relatively cheap or used good quality. I mean, there's a lot of guys, you know, upgrade and stuff like that. Like, you know, I've got the new uh, FLX 30 here and, uh, you know, uh, I've got a couple more that, uh, you know, are a little bit older and I'm saying, you know, to a buddy, hey, I'm, I'm probably going to pass this one on. Do you want it? Get a good deal on it, right? So that's what you do and, and uh, look for the used stuff or, or, or look for sales and stuff like that, but have at least one with you with your group so that if you're going out for the first time, whether even cameras, underwater cameras are really cool for kids to watch. They love it. My, my, my son's just like looking at this thing and that's all they didn't want it to do is watch it. Right. And it, it's kind of cool. Uh, but anything is better than nothing. That's what I always tell people. I don't so care what, what, what do they show you? Make. What's like, what's the reason for it? Like, can you show it again there? What you had? Uh, yeah, I, you can, I don't know if you'll actually see it, but if you look in the, there's a, there's an array of lights there. Yeah. Now those lights all, you know, you see it kind of flashing on and off. It shows your battery life. It'll show your underneath. It'll show you your depth, exactly how deep you are. Of course, we're in the water here. So it's going to say, use the manual, but uh, it, it, it spins around really super fast. And when a fish comes into the, into your, you get your lure out there and all of a sudden a fish will come into your zone, into your, into the cone of your, your transducer. And it'll so all of a sudden you'll see it and you can actually see how big that fish is. And it can all of a sudden just turn like quarter of an inch, half inch, and you go, oh, that's a big fish. So that's what it does. It allows you to know that there are fish down there and how it reacts to your bait because you'll sit there and you'll jiggle it and he'll take off or you'll pound it really hard and he'll come in and smash it. So then you keep doing the same thing over and over and over. Once you get them interested, then you start to play with them. And each fish you can play with, you know, all right, here, what's, what's that fish done? Oh, he took off on me when I, when I hit the bottom and ripped it up really fast. So the next one comes in and then this time, maybe you just pulse it really slow or you just jiggle it. You want to do stuff like that all the time. Changing, changing, changing is, is crucial. But uh, all of the flashes are similar to this. There's liquid crystals now too that, that don't have a, a spinning wheel in here basically that shows you, uh, but they all work. They're all great. Uh, it allows you to see that fish down there and how he's going to react to your bait. And that's crucial. You'll have, the other day I was out and they, you'd, you'd see, you'd rip your bait up really fast and it would flutter down. Uh, and uh, PK makes another one. I think some guys call it the peanut lure. It's actually a flutter fish. It's designed to have both sides are exactly the same on either side, each, each half. So it's like a peanut. And uh, this thing darts and flutters down like this when it's, when it's flipped up and darts off to the side and, and flutters back down like a wounded bait fish. And that thing caught me a lot of fish over the years as well. And again, you let the fish decide what it wants. You know, a lot of times you'll be, I mean, I was out a few years back and we were, we had every hook out there, every spoon, we were doing this, that we couldn't get them to go. You know, they'd come in, they'd, they'd look at your bait and take off. And my buddy Arden said, I'm going to try this thing. And it was, it had to be a flutter fish that was that big. And he put it on, dropped it on the bottom. And I went, you think that's too big? You know, they're negative. They're not going to bite it. Nope. We ripped that thing two or three times. He had about a five pound walleye on. Everybody changed to that style and, and, and lure. And we all started catching fish. So let the fish, you know, tell you what they want. Because a lot of times guys make the mistake of just staying there with a minnow and a jig or a this and a that. And, and they didn't want that. You start changing up colors and designs and bingo you'll be into fish again so versatility again is, is key how many times have you heard the story of uh 
first time kid going out fishing with their little Barbie rod and they, dad gives them the ugliest hook in the, in the tackle box and like, oh, they'll never catch anything. And then they land this long for right? And it's, you're, you're absolutely right. You can spend all this money on hooks and yeah. lures and whatever else. And then he catches it on the floating frog or whatever. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the stories you love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For um, sure. What about uh, what about the use of plastics, Tim? What you know? How how is that coming to effect? You know, it's very popular these days using plastics. Yeah, that 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 I think is going to eventually take over. <laughs> There's a minnow shorter, just in case people don't know that. But there, it's tough getting minnows down. Uh, a lot of stores have them, and uh, and I think they they may even run low this year. But uh, the 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 artificials out there now they're scented. I use a lot of scent. I push scent. I will put scent at times. I've got it in my tackle bag, right on the hook itself and the minnow, because I'm trying to turn that extra few fish that won't bite into biters. And uh, yeah, that's that's something that I've done over the years. I, I actually fished here probably, well, it's gotta be, a, you know, I'm aging myself, probably 15 years ago and we were out and the bite was super tough. We weren't catching any fish and I grabbed that fish scent and I put it on my, my lure and I dropped it down and the guys looked at me and said, yeah, whatever. And I was fighting a two pound walleye. You want some now? And we all put bait on, the same bait and the fish scent on, and it was lights out. They wanted something different. And that's that's what I find intriguing about fishing too, is just changing the color and the design of your hook and the type of hook, whether it's a PK or, or whatever you want to put down there, change, just keep changing because all of a sudden, boom, you're going to trigger them. And they're going to want this, or they, they might not want the, the up and down motion. They want maybe a, a more vertical motion to their lures change up you know with that too that's uh it's all it's all part of the fun of, of learning to you know, trick these walleye <laughs> so when when you're out fishing and do you um do you have a number of rods set up that you can just quickly run and gun and change or do, are you flipping off and on on a particular rod i i usually start with uh six rods and i've got a uh, different colors on on two of them uh then different two different designed lures on the other two and then I just have two that are empty, you know, and uh, just move from there to there to there. I was walking with, with two, or, two or three rods in a, in a pail or, uh, you know, in my hand, moving from spot to spot because I'll drop down a, a lure and work it. Oh, there's a fish there. He won't take it. Reel up, drop it back down with the flutter fish or another spoon and boom, he eats it. So, yeah, versatility is key. Uh, and, and changing uh, even the rod, just that. It's like a tournament. Like a, you don't have time to, to waste, a, you know, retie another jig on you, you know i got like six in in my boat right same thing ice fishing just making sure that you've got the uh, the array of tackle and you're moving from hole to hole to hole okay. and you know the, the, now the nice thing about the, the you know we used to use the old hockey sticks but these rods now i mean you can get a rod, rod real comma quality and i would say when you're fishing for walleye people have asked me what what do i like uh, best you've got to have something i don't know if you can see this this, this rod, it's got a pretty fast tip. It's a medium action. It's a Jason Mitchell medium action, but any medium action rod brand doesn't matter. Uh, but it's got to have backbone. You don't want, I don't know if you can see that, you don't want the rod starting to bend here. Right. That, rod, that rod's not going to start bending till almost three quarters away. And then, and then the last little bit, because that's fighting the fish, the last little tip part of it. Keep it a very stout rod medium action for the walleye because when you set that hook i mean you don't want it to noodle otherwise that not, hook's not going to get into his mouth yeah. and then when you're mouth, going, so. going for say like a panfish like uh, perch or crappies or whatever you want to you want to go to a little bit of a lighter a lighter rod so you can feel for that, sure that very yeah. yeah yeah or even see it maybe you'll just see that little you know perch fish and i mean there's times where i'm, I'm fishing with a slip bobber for perch i mean i'll put a, a small little uh, mag it on on a pk and it it'll push the the bobber over right. and it doesn't even pull it down you're just watching it go over and then you know he's on and you set it they'll hardly move that you got the little spring spring type uh, ends on your rods and just barely moves it and that's fish has got it right down his mouth and he's a, yeah. a pound perch you know it's amazing mm -hmm. tim is there a proper way to bring uh take your fish out of the water through a hole well i mean the, the best way to do it is i mean gingerly obviously because i mean it's a fish and it's a big one. Try and get underneath there, you know, there's gills here. Don't put it into the gills. Uh, put it under the gill, like the gill plate just under the throat of the fish. There's a gill plate and then the gills, but get it underneath there or 
corral it, grab it with two hands and, and kind of push it out if you can. Uh, it's pretty much fair game. I mean, he's thrashing in there and it's, you know, once he's in the hole, if you get more ice, like two feet, once he's in there, he's not backing out. So take your time, reach down, grab him, but try and get him in the gill plate. That's the safest. You know, you don't want to grab him by the eyes and squeeze him because that'll kill him and you might as well just keep that fish. Just try and as, as gingerly as you can or put your hand beside it and kind of flip it out. If you watch some of the videos that we post on, on, uh, on some of the, our Facebook page and stuff like that, you'll see the guys reaching down and, and pushing the fish out with their hands, kind of cupping it as best they can. Uh, you know, but yeah, try and stay away from the gills. And when you're taking the hooks out, make sure you got the forceps and you're gingerly taking them out again because that's, that's where the harm gets done. So you're saying yeah. you should reach into the water and grab the fish? Because I, I, I guess what I'm getting oh, yeah. at is you don't yeah. want to lift yeah. them out with the rod and the hook, or is that no. how you lose them? No. Or? Yeah, that's how you, you'll break your line because now all of a sudden as he's, when he's in the water, he's like, he's almost buoyant. There's hardly any weight to him at all. Uh, so that's why he comes up. But if you t take that same fish and you try and lift an eight pound or 10 pound walleye just straight up, now he's got all his weight and he's gone, right? Uh, so, great tip. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and, you know, if guys uh, use fire line and you could do it, you could horse them in, but you're harming the fish too. Just let him, let him in the hole. He bangs his head around a little bit, moves around, thrashes. Get your hand in there nice and slowly and pull him out while he comes. So. Obviously, um, just like summer fishing, there's a release process with some of these fish. Just getting them back turned around, they might, they might need a little bit of recovery, you know, from coming up and battling. Mm -hmm. So they'll need that recovery as they well. Sure so you know, by the tail, yeah. kind of. Yeah back and forth action like what yeah. what do you what are you suggesting there yeah yeah, yeah. just uh you know uh, get the hook out take your quick picture back in the water as fast as you can uh there's guys that'll build little and believe it or not they punch a hole and then they'll, they'll punch five or six or seven holes in a row but don't go through and then that other hole fills up with water and they perform they basically uh, transform it into a, a little live well Right. And they'll leave the fish in there, get their stuff ready, take their picture, drop it back in. You'll see some of the guys on, on the net doing that all the time. Yeah. I've even gone so far as to uh, uh, take a cooler with me like, and, and fill the cooler with water if, if uh, you're catching big fish and you want a good picture. I've done that before over the years. And we fill it up with water and then put the fish in there, get your stuff ready, boom, take the picture, that, down he goes. That's anything to keep those fish that, you know, we all have to look after in the, in the future uh, healthy that's what you want to do so tim before we get going here um pretty soon mm -hmm. uh i've got a question okay. i guarantee people are wondering so you're as big a ice fisherman as as anybody here uh give me your top three lakes around that that are good for walleye and for each one of those lakes what lure can somebody if they if they were to say well i heard tim use this what do you recommend for a lure for those fish and i'm, I'm not asking for your yeah. secret spots yeah. but no, i guarantee no, no. people want to no. know where they can catch walleye yeah uh you know what probably because i live so close to to uh to regina uh i think i think the last mountain lake is is like one of the best lakes out there to, to fish and pursue not only walleye, there's pike and there's perch and there's carp and there's other species out there that guys have a, a lot of fun catching. But for the walleye, it is it is my top dog. Uh, Tobin Lake, unbelievable lake as well. Uh, ice fishing again, uh, super fishing. But I mean, you got to know that, that's a river system, so you got to know where you're going. And uh, I would say uh, my second would be the Capel chains. Uh, anybody starting out that's just starting to fish, that's a lake that's smaller. Uh, the fish become more confined, so you can find areas where there's a lot of shacks or a lot of people or, or areas where you can have access foot, foot wise and, and even go out just in the middle of nowhere, as long as you're following the precautions that we talked about and be safe, that you can probably catch some fish. They're, they're full of fish. The size might not be there, but it is one of the, you know, premier chain of lakes out there. And that includes Crooked and Round and, and Pasco, Echo, Mission. Katapwa, all of those lakes are great lakes to, to learn and cut your teeth on. That's where I started. Last Mountain Lake and some of the bigger lakes like Tobin, they're tough slugging. I mean, I, if I was a beginner, I would be probably heading out to the smaller lakes uh, where, where you're going to get bit and you're going to take your kids out and have some fun. I mean, it was not uncommon to, to have a, you know, 60, 70s, 80, 80 fish days last year on, on some of those chain lakes. And again, it was, you know, they're, they're common community holes. Uh, you know, and you can have a lot of fun on them, practice your ca catch and release, safe release them, don't harm the fishery, you know, take a few home for supper and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll have a ball. And what's the so go-to lure? Be... 
You know, uh, again, of course, I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, in love with the PKs. <laughs> uh, I, I, right from day one, even before I even knew uh, anything about them, I'd seen them on the net uh, many moons ago. And I ordered a few, and the guy got a hold of me, Pat O'Grady, and he said, hey, you know what? You want a few more lures here? Try these ones out. And he sent me some, and I went out the first time I went out, and and I just destroyed the fish. And uh, I would say Red Dog Glow Nickelback or Red Dog Glow. Period. The new PK Rattle Spoons are are really coming into their own this year. Guys have been catching some really big fish on them and quality fish. Uh, there's various colors. We've got, you know, this has been the talk of the town. Is what they call the Wonder Bread, and it's got the you know the little blade on there to draw them in. Uh, so hopefully people will will Cra play this back just to to make sure they write <laughs> these down. Yeah, yeah, cra crawdad. Uh, that's another good color. Uh, we talked about red dot glow. That's that's always been a. Uh, there's guys that I know personally that don't even ever take that thing off. They just that's that's it. A buddy of mine, Josh, you might know him, Potter. He uh, he caught a 14 pound one on on that red dot glow. So. I mean, uh, yeah, a lot of, and then of course, flutterfish. I mean, these things, when, when one spoon isn't working, uh, go to something else. This flutters down like a wounded bait fish. I, I'll tip it with a small piece of minnow, a minnow head again, don't over, if you put too much on it, it, it the action is gone. And, and these are designed to actually trigger a fish into uh, thinking that's real and she flutters down and they eat it. We, lots of times the fish are negative. You don't wanna just sit there and say, okay, well, I got a downsize, downsize upsize there's a lot of times we'll go bigger and just keep ripping that spoon and it's reactionary bite they just come and crash it they want to know what it is they're not sure and they hit it anyway and uh, uh there's two you know two schools to that some guys oh downsize i've done that i've done well but if it's not working upsize kick yourself up to to a half ounce or three quarter ounce which you're not comfortable with because it's not it's not easy you know uh guys getting bigger stuff but your rewards can be really good too I know that there's there's tons of other stuff we want to ask you. I'm going to ask you two mm -hmm. things. Um, okay. One, eye loops on rods. Is there any tricks for them to not freeze up? And the other thing I wanted to ask you was um, about electric augers compared to gas augers. Just your your feel for that. Okay. The first thing uh, we we talk about it and mine. I mean, we were out yesterday and it was really windy and cold and it was freezing up with the wind. It seemed to. And it wasn't even you know, like it was only like minus six, but it froze up fast. But this is one of the keys is making sure that your the rods that you per, uh, purchase have like there's some really tiny ones, but you want a pretty good size top. And all these eyes are quite large and even bigger. It doesn't matter because all it's doing is holding your line. You don't want a really tiny one because as soon as that freezes up and it'll be like a rock and you now you're sticking it in your mouth and trying to warm it up with your fingers or whatever to chip away the ice. Not a good idea. And uh, so keep that in mind when you're looking for a rod, find one, you know, a tackle shop will, will tell you, you know, there's a lot of good tackle shops in town. Uh, they'll tell you exactly what you should be using. Uh, like I said, a combo like this, probably under a hundred bucks. So, you know, great Christmas present. <laughs> uh, now in regards to, uh, I've got both, I've got the gas and, uh, uh, and the electric. And you know what, I, th I think the electric is, is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Uh, the problem with the electrics is, is I, I'm a roamer, I'll drill 50, 60, 70 holes. So I've got to have at least two batteries. It will drain them down. Don't trust me. You've got three feet of ice. You're going to get 30 holes out of it, but then all of a sudden you want to move again. And it happened last year where we had to move so many times to find them. We had the gas auger with us. Once you found the fish, I mean, six, seven, eight holes, it's all you need. Uh, but the gas is, it's, uh, it's still here and a lot of guys won't give it up. But, you know, the way of the future is going to be those electric, uh, and they're getting so good now, 10 inch holes, you're punching through in, in seconds. And it's, I can actually push through with an electric faster than a gas. And uh, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> oh, another thing that we should talk about as that I written down here is, uh, what about for pike? And what's the, um, what's the tip up? What's that all about? Because I think that everybody when they want to catch a big pike are talking about running tip ups. Well, yeah, I mean, a, a tip-up is designed so that uh, basically a dead bait, uh, smelt or cisco, whatever people decide to use on there. Some people use herring. Uh, it's it's a it's a big harness. It's quick strike rig. It's leadered material. It's not like you're fishing for a walleye. Uh, they're heavy, and uh, 
uh, like heavy strength, like probably I, I used to use like 80 pound Dacron still do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, big treble hooks on those drop the bait down. Some people lay them right on the bottom. Some people keep it up, you know, six, eight, 10 inches. And the tip up is set up in, in such a way with it's insulated most of them. And there's a little flag when that flag sets off, you walk over there slowly. Guys won't run. A lot of guys you'll see run into a tip up, never run to a tip up. And I don't know, this guy told me this story and I believe him because we had flags that were going up when we were sitting there for tip up fishing. And if we ran, they dropped it. They can hear you on that ice. Boom, 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 boom. Trust me. They'll, especially if they just got it by the tail, they'll drop it and, and sit there and watch it. <clears throat> so yeah, that, uh, I mean, you, you, you walk up to it and you feel the fish. He's still moving. You wait till he stops and then you set with both hands and the battle's on. My biggest actually pike I ever caught through the ice with on a tip up was just under 30 pounds. It was a monster. And that was at Tolvan Lake. So where do you find, like, how do you fish with a tip up? Do you just walk away from it until the flag comes up? Because uh, yeah. growing, growing yeah. up, it seemed like if you ran those big, uh, baits you didn't catch much is it just one of those things where you catch you have to wait or you spend all day for you, one fish or you spend all day sometimes for one fish yeah yeah you're you're, you're fishing for a trophy of a lifetime on tip ups a lot of times in some of these places <clears throat> we'd get to anywhere from 10 to to 20 fish in a day is a good day for for tip up fishing and the fish were between five and and 25 pounds it's quite common and depending on your what body of water but uh, yeah, you set them up there and you, you got, you know, you can have two lines out in Saskatchewan. Some places you can't, some places more, but uh, you just set them up and sit back and have a coffee. And, and some guys just sit in their shacks and, and watch their tip ups from the window. There's the flags up and out we go and yeah, pull in the fish. Yeah. yeah. So Growing up, we didn't have, quick... we didn't... sorry, Tim, go ahead. Nope. No, it's quick strike too, because as soon as you get it, it's double hooks. As soon as you grab that fish, it, the line, you just set the hook in instantly, right? Make sure he's not running though. He's stopped because, uh, yeah, if he's still pulling out line, wait till he stops, the bail stops moving. Okay. He's grab it. You real, you know, pull it in slowly and then set the hook in. And, uh, I, that, you know what? That's a good tip. I would have never known that because the last time I went tip up fishing there, it was running and I pulled it like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let it, let it stop. He, then he turns it, swallows it, and then, then you let him have it. Yeah. yeah. Some of my, some of my fondest memories fishing with my dad was tip up fishing. We'd, he, he made his own tip up straight uh, out of uh, some material he had at home and some big Norwegian line, I guess it's called the green, mm -hmm. that green, that green stuff with uh, some big hooks. And we, we caught some mm -hmm. big, big, uh, big pike over the years with, with uh, tip up fishing for sure. So uh, one yeah. question I have, oh, yeah. Tim, is, uh, people that set up uh, with their holes, you see that some people will, will take a shovel and they'll shovel around their holes for light. Uh, does that make a difference for fish when it when you're out fishing uh, with heavy snow cover? Is it clear around th that hole to get some light through there or is that just a old wives tale? Uh, I, I do clear some of the, the snow around only because it makes it easier to access the fish when you catch it. If you're pike fishing, you want to clear a little bit of, around so that you can get your your tip up down in there and stuff like that. That's, that's fine. But yeah, you know, once that ice starts forming, you know, there's three feet of ice. I don't think it, it has a lot, a lot of bearing on it. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, you know, when you're fishing down in that 25 feet, that, that light doesn't penetrate very much. So that's does why it, a lot of times that glow, glow ring. Does the works. thickness of the ice um, affect the ability to catch fish? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I actually found this year with this, you know, we're, we're, we're fishing about six to eight inches now and I have never seen fish fight so hard and use the ice to their advantage there. And it's clear ice and you're looking down there and that fish is thrashing his head against underneath the ice. And it's like, he's shaking it like a rag doll and he's right up against the ice banging his head. I had a lot of big fish come on button this year and I know that's what they're doing. And other guys I know are saying, what's going on. I got him right to the hole and they're letting go. They're, they're using that ice and they're got that hook right up against the ice and they're shaking it like a, a bone in a dog's mouth. You know, he's just trying to get rid of it. And uh, that's what they're doing. When it gets deeper ice, it doesn't, they don't seem to do that for some reason. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think because they, they can see and it's clear and they think it's like the top of the water, like they're, it's open water. Okay. Cause they're, I mean, they can see just like me and you. So yeah, with a little bit of snow cover and thicker ice, I don't think they can see that. So they get pulled and they're fighting downwards and then all of a sudden, oh, they're in the hole and they're out. So. That's, why does why does yeah. ice fishing um why does it slow down uh so bad 
Uh, I think they're just done their feeding. They really gorge themselves early. Uh, they're already making eggs. I mean, we cl we cleaned uh, a couple perch the other day, and they were like, "Holy smokes!" And they were like, "11 inch perch." Of course, you know, good eaters and that. And uh, some of the walleye are already they're already making their eggs, and they're, they're getting fattened up. And and fish move a lot quicker to start their spawning process than people realize. It's into March already, and they're they're already saying, "I don't want to bite anymore." Uh, so that's that's why they they fill themselves up with as much feed as they can, and then the cycle of you know. They're getting ready. They're going to start their spawning process. So does it, is it a wise tale that, uh, like I was a bit, always been told that, that when you get to a point in the winter, usually you get into a fishing law where is it because the, the, the water is cold and the, their, their bait is not moving and they basically go dormant. Is that just a wise tale or. I don't know if it's so much a wise tale. I think, I think the fish move so much deeper as the year wears on. And uh, I refuse to go out into that, deep, deep water to, to chase them. Uh, I know some guys do, and they do catch fish. I keep under 30 feet. I just don't want to harm the fish yeah. in the fishery. So uh, I know guys that have gone out in deeper water and, you know, they get kind of, <laughs> you're raked over the coals. It ain't worth it, you know, like you're hurting a lot of fish. So s stay under that, you know, that 30 foot mark and you'll catch plenty of fish. Yes, they still come in. You know, if you know the spots and you spot on a spot, you will still get some fish. It's not going to be the, you know, the, the slaughterhouse, as they say, and you catch a, you know, 50 fish in a day, uh, you know, you're still going to get some fish. But, you know, most of the time it isn't actually even the catching. It's just being out there in the outdoors, yeah. uh, having a lot of fun with your friends. It's a COVID year, so what a better place to be than out on the ice and social distancing catching fish. <laughs> I, want, I want to just get your opinion here, Tim. Uh, a lot of our listeners, they'll be chiming in. We'll have uh, either young young kids or, or, or um, you know, they're getting to the age where they're going to take taking their little ones to the outdoors. What are what are some things? That, obviously, catching fish helps, but what are some things that will keep kids engaged uh, with the, the 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 love of fishing? How can we instill that that you know, going onto the ice with them is an enjoyable? What are some things that you've seen or worked with you in the past that will keep get kids engaged with uh, the love of ice fishing? Yeah, uh, key number one is is don't stress those kids out. And what I mean by that, when they want to get up at, you know, I get up at, at six o'clock and I'm walking out the door by six thirty. Don't do that with your children. When you're starting off, take your time, get them dressed up, get everything that they if they want to take their little, you know, toy along or whatever, let them bring it. Never stop them from doing that. They're going to be so darn excited to go ice fishing anyway. They probably leave it behind. But the key is no pressure. You're going out. Uh, you, be comfortable. Be safe. Uh, you know, get some information before, you know, the, again, the local tackle shops and, and people on the net are more than willing. You know, if somebody wants to throw me a, a private message on, hey, where can I take my kids out? I'll, I'll give some spots that, you know, are producing fish. You're always going to catch something. Maybe it's not going to be the maybe that day you don't but i mean i'll help out we all will that's that's part of it to keep the sport going and uh yeah just take let them take whatever they want and and an ice shack is it, there's so many nice pop-ups and flip overs and stuff like that uh, take one out uh, or buy one and take that out with you with a little heater keep them comfortable keep them you know entertained with a like a little underwater camera is so much fun especially perch fishing with young kids and watch that lure there for hours <laughs> so that's the key is just uh enjoying it making it a a, a full meal deal you have to take them out and just have a lot of fun and, and the, the catching is secondary so yeah i remember uh you know having a, a fire in the shack and bringing some pierogies that were boiled ready and we'd we'd oh, yeah. fry the pierogies <laughs> and some sausage and then uh having a cuban lunch out there would, would help as well so yeah, yeah yeah take your lunch that's for sure yeah. So, so Tim, we're going to wrap it up here, but um, okay. if, if, if somebody was to say, what does Tim Jenny take for, for equipment when he goes ice fishing, what would you tell him? Uh, number one, uh, your, your proper clothing. I mean, you gotta be, you gotta dress warm. You gotta have all the safety equipment with you. Uh, you gotta have your proper bait. You gotta have your flasher charged up. You have your rods and reels all ready to go. Preparation is number one, uh, and your ice auger needs to be charged and or gassed up and fueled. Everything is prepared the day before. The last thing you want to do is say, well, I'm going to start getting this ready in the morning. It'll be noon before you get out. Preparation, uh, knowledge of the lake and where you're going and, and what species you're going to attack. You're not going to go for pike with my walleye stuff. 
you know, although I did to catch some big pike with it, uh, incidentally, but I'm, when I'm chasing walleye, but just be prepped, uh, make sure you're out there, uh, doing your, uh, your homework and, uh, you should have a great time. And again, mo most people are very, you know, if, if you got a question, there's some fishing Saskatchewan site, uh, ice fishing Saskatchewan, your site, any uh, PK site, I don't care what it is. These guys are more than happy, uh, to help you out. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And to ask the question and say, Hey, you know, a lot of guys, you know, kind of free, Oh, go do it yourself. But guys don't have that time and that luxury. You know, I have no problem. Again, somebody wants to private message me and say, you know, you might not be, get my GPS coordinates, but I'll say, Hey, they're biting on this lake or, Hey, try out that lake and, and try 15 feet of water. That's where I've been having my best luck. So uh, I don't mind helping out people. I mean, that's, that's what's going to make the sport better and for everybody and more enjoyable, you know? So that's the, uh, that's the key. Uh, and on, on that, I'm going to also say something here. Cool. Muck, I'm going to, whoever uh, comments on this uh, podcast, I'm going to send them a, a whack of PKs so that That's they nice. can uh, let, uh, let uh, Muck pick the name and I'll get these off to you so you can enjoy some great ice fishing as well. Oh, great. So that'll awesome. help somebody out and uh, maybe it'll be a good Christmas present for the little guy. Absolutely. That's awesome. Thank All you. Right. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, no so problem. Tim, um, uh, if anybody wants to get PK lures from, uh, where can they find them? Do they buy them direct from you or how can they get a hold of you? And uh, like, how can somebody connect with you if they want to get some information? Yeah, the, the, we have a PK website, but uh, the tackle shops in town, uh, most of your major centers, most of your tackle shops, uh, uh, they all carry the product. So any of them, you'll be able to go in and, and grab them. Uh, so do you have your own? No do you have your own PK website or Facebook page? There, there's there is a website. Yeah, if if people so choose. But you know, uh, the, the, like I said, that you should have the tackle shops are are stocked right up. It's a great stocking stuffer if you want to, you know, uh, get one for grandpa or dad and the kids, and uh, they've got them all, and uh, they're right here right now. Uh, shipping, of course, you know, you can you can do that, but I mean, it, it takes some time. So, I mean, it's supposed to be a nice weekend next week, and you don't want to. Be waiting for him in the tap in the uh, mill yeah. <laughs> to come. <laughs> so, yeah. Darren, you got anything before we head out? Well, you know what? I, I got a Tim Jenny story. Actually, uh, <laughs> it was the first first or second year that we had the Parkland Outdoor Show. Tim Tim came with PK Lures, and I believe it might have been the first year when when they came, and uh, they had a board at that time. It wasn't a very big board, but they had a board with all the PK Lures and stuff, and I. I kind of said, you know what, you guys should bring some lures to sell. I think if you're in Yorkton, if uh, they're if they're like the Ukrainians, like my dad, that show up, they want to buy something that day. <laughs> and people were coming wanting to buy. Tim, you, I mean, you might remember this. They're wanting to buy those lures from you guys, but there was a display that you guys had up. Yeah. So he suggested they go uptown. And at that time, I believe Home Hardware was the only place carrying them in Yorkton at that time. Um, they were open only Saturday because they weren't open Sunday. They sold every PK lure in the store that weekend on that Saturday. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. The, the next year they came back. The second year, I believe, Tim came back. They were actually selling them at the show. So I think they learned their lesson the, that, that year. But <laughs> the thing that, I, that stands out uh, that I remember best about, about Tim is uh, at, a, at a banquet we had, I believe it was that second year, and we were raising some money for a, for a young guy, uh, a, young fa a family that had a young boy. And uh, it was Tim Jenny that rallied the troops there that, that raised a bunch of money for a, a special school for that kid. So, Tim, we really appreciate your big heart and you're a big fisherman, but your heart is definitely bigger than uh, your fishing accomplishments. So, Thank you. Uh, we still keep in touch with the young lad. He's doing great. So, yeah. That's awesome. You know what? I think that's what I love about the, uh, the outdoors and everything that we do is that uh, it just brings people together. And that's... Uh, I mean, that's how Darren and I became best friends is, is, is for uh, the Parkland Outdoor Show and Expo and the reasons and the, and the things that they do there. Uh, Tim, can they get, can people get a hold of you directly on Facebook? Uh, yeah, you, I, uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. So if somebody wants to PM or through PK Lures, uh, uh, Kurt and Pat monitor that as well. And they can, any questions they direct back to me. So you can go to PK Lures Facebook. Facebook and are, and are you and going to be yeah. back at the show or what's your plans? Are you going to be back so people can hook up with you? Hook up with you. There's a good pun there. <laughs> oh, the, the Parkland show? Yeah. Are you hoping year? to come back? Or? 
Well, we, we've, we've certainly talked about it. The, you know, the last couple of years, we, we made it to Winnipeg. So uh, Kurt has a lot of shows that he does down in the U.S. and whatnot. So it is, it's a time thing, right? And, uh, you know, I keep poking him saying, we should come back. And yeah, I think I might have him convinced. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. uh, this is a great way to, to bring on the ice fishing season, Tim. I couldn't thank you enough for, uh, for joining, joining us. Uh, I know people are just buzzing about getting over walleye. Oh yeah, real quick. What's the bite like right now? The bite's been phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, this, you know, the weather changes will actually affect it. So be careful. Uh, if you're picking a day and it's really windy and the front's coming through, you know what, you know, with the kids or whatever, you want to, you know, kind of choose something else. Just, just, uh, just there on the, the fact that it's, it could be off, but once it sets up again and you get stable weather, whether it's stable weather, cold or, or warmer, that's key is stable. So watch your barometric pressure guys. Don't believe in that, but it does affect it. If it goes up and down really fast, it can either, you can have a super day and go back to those same holes and crickets, nothing, you know, and the fish are still there. They just, they just won't go they, You know, it's just like summertime. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, it's it kind of, it's kind of funny, Tim, when I, when, I, when I asked you to do the show and you said you would, uh, and I said it'd run about an hour and you kind of chuckled saying, well, I don't know how we could talk for an hour. And I said, <laughs> it's, it's, with, with what our guests have had to, to uh, share on the program, it always, always, we could talk for hours. And because right. it just, the, you, guys, you guys are so wealth of knowledge that it's it's amazing and i just see the time here that we've already went an hour and and we could keep going oh, yeah. um yeah. we're definitely going to ask you to come back uh it was i know that we sure. can we can uh yeah. spend another hour talking fishing um darren right. uh thanks again for everything that you do buddy um everybody i want you guys to have a safe and covid free christmas uh and the new year and you know i don't we, we try not to talk too much about what the COVID has been doing to our industry, but I just wanted to say to everybody, hang in there. Um, one of these days, this is going to break and we're, we're going to be able to get back at it. I, I will say from this hunting season, I've been hunting, I'm, I'm turning 50 in a month and I've been hunting since I 12. And I would say that there's more hunters this year than there's ever been in my entire life. And I mean, we can blame COVID for a lot of things, but it did bring people back to hunting and, and fishing. So, because they, a lot of people didn't have anything else to do. So yeah. thank goodness for that. But anyways, we're going to beat this thing and uh, yeah, stay tuned, everybody. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Darren. I, I want to share what, one thing, Buck, those, those viewers that are out there, if you are looking for Christmas gifts, get out and support those people that support the industry, if it's buying a hook, if it's going to maybe go into an outfitter that is still open to, uh, you know, provincial visitors, go support those industries. Those people are really hurting right now. So if you have an opportunity to, to buy, like Tim said, buy some stuffing stalkers, if it's hooks, if it's, you know, a new fishing rod for somebody, if it's a, uh, instead of buying a toy, buy, buy some, a, a youth, uh, a fishing package, let's just get out there and keep those people in our industry supported and, and know that, we don't want them to go under because we need them when this thing is going to be done. But as, as you're saying, like, this is a great opportunity to get somebody out in the field and, or out on the, out on the hard water. So, you know, those viewers that are out there, you know, make, uh, make Christmas this year, make it an outdoor gift. Well, I'll leave it at this. Yeah. I think ice fishing beyond any, any other outdoor sport that we can do is probably the easiest to get your family and friends out to because you really just need a hole and you need a line. Whereas other things might be very technical. If you just want to do a family adventure, ice fishing is where it's at for mm -hmm. sure. For sure. Yeah. Oh, All right, guys. Totally have agree. Merry, Merry Christmas and uh, stay safe. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Yep, Thanks likewise. everybody for Take watching. Bye-bye.